Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jordan Badu. I work with Professor Anthony Gerbic in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Michigan. We're here today to present to you our work on unit cell polarizability and sheet impedance extraction in aperiodic environments. So what is the current state of the art in optimized metasurfaces? Metasurfaces these days are being optimized in order to provide optimal performance. These optimizations introduce aperiodicity into the metasurfaces, and therefore the sheet impedances that result can become non-locally periodic, which makes the extraction of the sheet impedances from printed circuit elements in these environments very difficult. For example, in the upper left, we have some work from Professor Eleftheriotis' group that is for metasurfaces with line sources embedded in the substrate. The authors are able to beam form using these types of metasurfaces. Their designs result in aperiodic metasurface sheet impedances. In reference number two, we also have some work from L.F. Theriotis' group where the authors place a Huygens metasurface over a linear patch array in order to perform beam forming. They also end up with aperiodic sheet impedances. They realize their metasurfaces by putting V offenses in between each of the elements. On the right, we have some work from my group, which is uh, on conformal metasurfaces. These metasurfaces are optimized in order to introduce perturbations and excite a number of surface waves that allow one to control amplitude and phase. In the example shown, a cylindrical wave emanated from a line source reflects from a conformal metasurface and becomes a planar wavefront. The optimization results in a highly aperiodic metasurface environment. In these referenced works, aperiodic metasurfaces are also created for the purposes of electromagnetic illusions. In the work on the upper left from Du Hun Quan's group, we have a illusion metasurface which generates the scattered fields from a PEC triangle when a cylindrical metasurface is illuminated. The, the sheet impedances that result from this work are also highly aperiodic. On the right, we have work from Professor Gupta's group, which is for also electromagnetic illusion metasurfaces, where a metasurface is designed to scatter the fields of a PEC rectangular object. Professor Gupta's work results in complex sheet impedances. Some previous work that is uh, related to trying to realize these aperiodic metasurfaces, uh, which are difficult to realize with lo traditional locally periodic extraction approaches, is one from Du Hun Quan's group. Uh, Professor Du Hun Quan was able to use the point dipole approximation and try to find a local electric field which excites a given dipole by using the uh, known near fields radiated by dipoles and also by homogenizing the sheet outside of a certain radius r. Uh, this approach works very well for point dipole approximations. From the polarizability model, one can replace each point dipole with a metallic element if the local electric field is known. Uh, the problem is, from using the point dipole approximation, this may break down for elements which have close spacing. And also, how do you incorporate ground plane layers? Uh, you could incorporate a ground plane layer if you used image theory, of course, but that doesn't address the finiteness of, uh, of a ground plane, which might be finite, of course. So what makes these metasurfaces difficult to realize? Well, first off, they're not locally periodic. The environments that the metasurface elements are in are not locally periodic. So the traditional approaches of sheet impedance extraction from printed circuit elements, uh, assuming local periodicity, does not apply. Uh, we know that in general, the impedance of a printed circuit element is a function of its geometry and is independent of the excitation. Thus, any extraction method that you use should yield the same sheet impedance for a given printed circuit element. However, this is only true if the element is not spatially dispersive. Then the impedance does depend on the excitation. Uh, the impedance, of course, also depends on the local environment. So what do we have? We have three problems uh, indicated here. On the upper left, we show that the metasurface environment is not locally periodic. Later in this talk, I will show you what this plot means, but what it shows is the difference between uh, cladding that's extracted assuming local periodicity and the cladding that's extracted in my new approach I'm gonna to present today. And you can see that the, the claddings are very different. In the center, we show the spatial dispersion or the sheet impedance as a function of incident angle of the illuminating plane wave for a printed circuit element shown in the figure. Uh, we can see that the sheet impedance depends on the incident angle. And on the very right, even if we were able to characterize the sheet impedance as a function of angle, we would have to consider that for each of the plane waves, which would make up the actual excitation, because the excitation on each element is not a single plane wave. 
What I'm showing in the figure on the upper right is the local electric field for the second element from the left of the metasurface shown at the bottom, which is the example we're going to present in today's work. It is a wide angle reflecting metasurface and it's finite. That's the key here. Uh, the plane wave comes in and reflects to 70 degrees off a of broadside, all from a finite width metasurface. So the edge diffraction will be considered from the finite edges. Um, from the second element from the left, we see the local electric field that excites that given uh, sheet impedance element or, or printed circuit element is, is definitely not a single plane wave. So that makes the extraction difficult and more complicated. So just to go over how we designed these metasurfaces, we've come up with a three-phase design approach. First, we take the metallic cladding of a single-layered RF substrate and we homogenize it. We homogenize it because the design, in the, the design in the original domain is costly. It's too costly. It's difficult. Uh, so we solve a, an integral equation or a finite element problem, some kind of electromagnetics problem on the homogenized model. And in general, that results in a complex valued sheet impedance because the field transformation from the known incident field to the desired scattered field may not preserve power locally, power density locally. So what we do in phase two is we introduce gradient descent optimization accelerated with the adjoint field method or adjoint variable method in order to uh, optimize the metasurface reactances. So we throw out the real part, throw out the resistances of the complex value sheet impedance attained from phase one and optimize the remaining reactances such that a number of surface waves are introduced on the surface of the metasurface uh, such that power is redistributed from points where loss is needed to points where gain is needed. Uh, we can see an example of that in the upper right where I have plotted a uh, typical metasurface optimization. And what we're showing there is the uh, plane wave spectrum of the scattered field at the metasurface plane. Phase one is shown in the blue curve where it's a complex valued sheet reactance or sheet impedance rather. And that, that complex valued sheet impedance does not have a lot of evanescent spectrum. When we go to phase two and we introduce uh, the optimization approach, we um, end up with a purely reactive sheet, but we also introduce a bunch of surface waves, which is evident in the evanescent spectrum shown in the figure in the upper right. And then in phase three, we go to uh, back to pattern metallic cladding using the sheet impedance extraction approach. However, the phase two introduces a aperiodic metasurface environment, a highly non-smoothly varying uh, sheet impedance or sheet reactance environment. So new approaches must be used in order to extract the sheet impedances of printed circuit elements in these environments. And that's what we're gonna to present today. So the big picture overview of our solution begins with determining the true inhomogeneous excitation. So from phase two, we have the solved linear system of the homogenized model. It could be from method of moments, finite element method, coupled dipole method, whatever it may be. But it's written in the form of V equals to ZI for the homogenized sheet model. So what I'm showing in the lower right is uh, the matrix equation, V equals to ZI written in its full form. For the example that I'm going to use for the sake of explanation, we have five elements that are collinear, or, or they're, par they're uh, all aligned in a, in a row. We have eta sheet one through eta sheet five for each of the elements. They carry their own sheet impedance. And there are currents I1 through I5 driven in each of the five elements, which are all known from the solution of the homogenized model. What we ask ourselves is, what is the actual local electric field exciting particle number two, for example? That electric field is the incident field plus the field scattered by all its neighbors onto that element. We do not consider the field scattered by the element number two uh, by itself or the self scattering. We can obtain this information from the solved linear system if we look at the row, row number two of the solved linear system. Using the information of, in the row, we can find this total or this uh, local electric field. I've written row number two on the lower left of the slide and I've moved all the terms except for the self term to the left side of the equation. And what you end up with is the local electric field, which is nothing but the incident field plus the field scattered by all its neighbors. And, um, and uh, that's equal to the sheet impedance, the loaded sheet impedance multiplied by the current driven through that, ele that element. If we divide both sides by the current driven through the element, then we obtain the sheet impedance in the aperiodic environment, E local divided by I2 which is equal to Z22 plus A to sheet two. So that represents a local sheet impedance in the aperiodic environment directly from the homogenized model. So once we know the true excitation due to all the aperiodic and, and finite neighbors, uh, we are able to then calculate uh, you know, what the, the excitation should be. From there, we can determine the true aperiodic coupling of that current onto its neighbors in order to form a cost function. So these are the two big ideas of this work. So what is the scattered field from particle two onto all of the other particles? 
Well, if we use now the column of the solved linear system, and we have some known current I2, then we can find what the scattered field is on each of the neighboring elements due to current I2 by using the column of the solved linear system. And that is shown in the equation in the upper left. Uh, below that, what we can say is if we were to replace sheet impedance number two with a printed circuit part, uh, we could find what the scatter field is due to the current induced on that printed circuit part by using the same column of the matrix. So we have uh, that is shown in, in the middle equation. The error in the scattered field is the, the field due to current number two on all of its neighbors minus the field due to current two um, onto all of its neighbors at, from the printed circuit geometry. So the first one is the impedance sheet. The second one is the printed circuit geometry. And we're comparing those two scattered fields to ensure that the printed circuit geometry scatters the same electric field onto all of its neighbors. Um, we can form a cost function by just saying delta E scat transpose times delta E scat. What is the idea here? What is the advantage? Well, a sheet impedance element and a printed circuit part will never share the same exact current distribution. They'll scatter the same fields uh, onto their neighbors or, or some distance away from the element, but they will not share the same current distribution because it's different boundary conditions that are satisfied on those parts. Furthermore, the, um, the near, very near fields, the evanescent fields due to all of the fine features of the printed circuit elements will be very different than that on the sheet impedance elements. So it's disadvantages to compare the current density directly or the evanescent fields directly in the unit cell. Rather, what you should do is try to compare the influence of those currents onto their near neighbors, because that should be identical. So as a big picture overview of our solution, we take the uh, solved linear system and we find the true inhomogeneous excitation on element number two within a unit cell, for example. Then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, expand that one dimensional excitation because all the problems that we're explaining today are um, two dimensional electromagnetics problems, meaning they're invariant in and out of the board. So we're going to expand this 1D excitation into a vertically invariant two dimensional excitation so we can impress that electric field, the local electric field, directly onto a printed circuit part in console multiphysics. We're going to simulate that printed circuit element uh, with, with that impressed e local electric field obtained from the solved linear system in console multiphysics, export the current in a 2D sheet sense on the printed circuit part. We're going to homogenize it vertically and sample that current density, the, the homogenized uh, current density, so that we can convert it into a 1D line current that's suitable for um, introduction into the linear system that we originally solved in the homogenized domain. And I'll explain that more in detail next. So how do we impress the local electric field that we obtain from the linear system onto the pattern geometry? Well, we're going to use a magnetic current box. And what that magnetic current box is, is uh, it's designed such that by surface equivalence theorem that it bathes the printed circuit part in E local. So if you look at the lower left uh, by surface equivalence theorem, we can find magnetic sheet currents that will generate E local inside of the box and will generate zero field outside of the box because of the sub wavelength separation between the sides of the box. So we use this kind of current box, this magnetic current box, to impress E local onto the printed circuit part in console multiphysics. To incorporate the ground plane, what we do is we use image theory. So we also bathe an additional part, which is twice the separation from the element to the ground plane behind the original printed circuit part, but we excite it with negative E local. So this part is where we uh, have already simulated the printed circuit part in console multiphysics, and we've exported the current, which is shown in the left uh, side of the slide. We have the phase in the upper portion and the amplitude in the lower portion. Then we vertically homogenize it using the equation shown in the lower graph of the center of the slide, uh, just by integrating vertically and dividing by the unit cell height. And we can collapse that or average it into a 1D current representation. Then we sample that 1D current representation at the same discretization as the method of moments problem to make that current uh, compatible with the method of moment matrices in the solved linear system. Now, once we've done that averaging, we have to go back in and scale the current just slightly in order to obtain the right result for the self term in the unit cell because we only compare the fields that are scattered to the neighbors and we never consider the self term. Uh, the way we handle that is we compare the electric field radiated by the printed circuit part in console at an observation plane lambda by five above the element with that 
of the analytically calculated near field at lambda by five above the element using the exported and averaged and interpolated current density. When those two near fields agree, then we know we have the correct exported, interpolated, and, and, and averaged current density from method of moments or from COMSOL, which makes it compatible with method of moments. So now we can create a cost function. Uh, the cost function has three terms. One ensures the coupling to all the other elements and the ground plane is the same as it was in the homogenized model, and that's shown as delta E scat. So we basically look at the scatter field from the impedance sheet uh, homogenized model and the scatter field from the printed circuit geometry and the homo uh, printed circuit geometry and make sure that those um, are the same. The second term ensures that the far fields are the same by calculating the far field due to the current uh, from the method moment solution and the current due to the uh, printed circuit geometry. And the third term ensures the radiative near field is the same uh, between the method of moment solution or the homogenized model and that of the uh, the console printed circuit part. So by satisfying these three terms in the cost function, we're able to obtain identical performance between the homogenized model and or the solved linear system and the printed circuit part, uh, the current distribution induced on that. So now I'll go through the results. We have a finite width, finite width, eight lambda wide, wide angle reflecting metasurface that will take a normally incident plane wave and reflect it to 70 degrees off the normal. Um, the metasurface dimensions are shown here, lambda by 20 separation between the metasurface elements in the ground plane. They are finite discrete sheet impedances and <clears throat> they're all coupled through the linear system. Phase one results in the complex value sheet impedance shown on the left uh, and the pattern shown in the center of the slide. And phase two results, when we optimize, result in a completely reactive sheet impedance on the lower, lower left. And the pattern in the far field is exactly the same, shown in the center. And the reflected near field, uh, the real part of the reflected near field is shown in the figure in the lower right. So now we need to replace each of these homogenized elements with printed circuit parts using our aperiodic extraction approach. Here we show the results of phase three. We're going to, we have already completed the aperiodic extraction. Now we're going to do simulation on the full wave cladding of the uh, now aperiodic extracted metasurface. I'm going to simulate that and compare it to um, the cladding and the simulation of the cladding that you would have obtained using the traditional local, period, local periodicity approach. Shown in the middle of the slide is the uh, results for the local periodicity approximation. We see that we do not get the scattered near field correct or the far field correct. By using the aperiodic extraction approach, we do get the correct far field and near field shown in the lower portion of the slide. These results are obtained from full wave simulation and console of the cladding, the actual pattern metallic cladding. Pattern metallic cladding. Finally, we will compare the claddings uh, that we obtained using the tra traditional local periodic approaches and the new aperiodic extraction approach. In the lower right, we show the direct comparison between the claddings. The blue dots are the, the length of the teeth of an interdigitated, interdigitated capacitor for aperiodic extraction approach compared to that for a periodic, uh, local periodic extraction approach. The details of the local periodic extraction approach are shown in the lower left, where we just simply extract the Z matrix of um, a normally incident plane wave excitation in a periodic environment using flow K plane waves. And then we map the Z, the sheet impedance to the, the Z matrix elements for each of the lengths of the teeth. So in conclusion, we've introduced a new extraction approach for aperiodic metasurface unit cell environments. We obtained much improved results which have not been possible without the new approach. And these approaches can be useful for the realization of conformal non-planar metasurfaces. And with that, I'd like to thank you for paying attention to my talk.